has rescued me Thank God we've been covered Covered, we've been covered Oh, we are walking And we are living Oh, we are, we are We've been covered Oh, don't you know Jesus has rescued me here And now Satan, you have no more hold on our lives For we will speak the name of Jesus Christ Now you still come knocking on our door when you can Oh, but we have been covered by the blood of the Lamb that we are We are covered Oh, we are walking and we are living. Oh, we've been, we've been, we are. Oh, don't you know Jesus has rescued me here? Thank God I'm come. Are you come? Are you covered? Oh, we are walking and we are living. Oh, we are. Oh, don't you know Jesus has rescued me here? Thank God we're covered. We are. Are you covered? Where are you walking? And are you living? Saints, are you? Are you covered? Covered by His blood. Jesus has rescued me here. Thank God I. I am, I am covered Where I am walking And I am living Oh, I am, I am covered Covered Don't you know Jesus has rescued me here Thank God I've been covered I've been, I've been covered Where I am walking And I am Living. Oh, I am, I am, I am Don't you know Jesus has rescued me Thank God I'm covered, I am covered Where I am walking and I am living Well, I am, I am, I am covered Oh, don't you know Jesus has rescued me. Oh, somebody lift your hands and thank God that you're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody just needs to lift your hands and say, thank God I'm covered. Thank God I'm covered. Thank God I'm covered. If you got an insurance policy, you're covered. Hallelujah. And I've got an insurance policy from Jesus Christ that I am covered, that whenever I leave this body, that he's coming to take me to a better place. Hallelujah. And I am covered. I am covered. I am covered. I am covered. Somebody need to lift your hands and say, I'm covered. I'm covered. I'm covered. I'm covered. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody needs to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the blood. Silence, 
were locked in the Roman jail Back in the Bible days They had no one to pay the bill An earthquake came And it shook the doors open Well they came out singing and shouting And praising the Savior's name If he has to reach way down Jesus will pick you up If he has to reach way down Jesus will pick you up If he has to reach way down Jesus will pick you up Oh, Jesus will pick you up If he has to reach way down Shadrach, Meshach And the Billy Gold Were tossed in a fiery furnace A long, long time ago The God stepped in And took the heat out of the flame Well, they came out singing and shouting And praising the Savior's name If he has to reach way down. Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way down. Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way down. Jesus will pick you up. Oh, Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way down. Oh, he'll reach way down. He'll reach way down. He'll reach way down. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? What he did for Paul and Silas He'll do for me and you He'll pick you out that mountain clay He'll set your feet a dancing On a mighty rock to stay He'll reach your way down 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 He'll pick you out that mountain clay He'll set your feet a dancing up on a mighty rock to stay Jesus will reach way down He'll 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 shut your feet a dancing up on a mighty rock to stay He'll reach way down He'll reach way down He'll reach away down He'll reach away down Right down where you are Jesus will pick you up 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 Set your feet a dancing On a mighty rock to stay Jesus will pick you up Wanna do it, wanna do it What he did for Paul and Silas He'll do for me and you Jesus will pick you up Jesus will pick you up Out of that mire clay Jesus will pick you up Jesus will pick you up Jesus will pick you up Get set your feet a dancing up On a mighty rock to stay Jesus will pick you up 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 Out of your mire clay He'll set your feet a dancing up On a mighty rock to stay Oh Jesus will pick you up he will pick you up Right down where you are Jesus will pick you up 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 Wanna do it, wanna do it Wanna do it, wanna do it Wanna do it, wanna do it Jesus will pick you up Jesus will pick you up Jesus will pick you up Out of your mind and play Right down where you are Out of your sick bed Out of your current room Well, Jesus will pick you up Jesus will pick you up Jesus will pick you up He'll give you the victory Cause will pick you up Cause will pick you up Jesus will pick you up Jesus will pick you up Jesus will pick you up Out of that mess you're in Make you whole within 
Pick you two, pick you up. Our chick, now he'll pick you up. Jesus will pick you up. Jesus will pick you up. Jesus will pick you up. Oh, now Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way. If he has to reach way down. Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way down. Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way down. Jesus will pick you up. Oh, Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way. If he has to reach way down. Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way down. Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way down. Jesus will pick you up. Oh, Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way. Oh, he'll reach way down. He'll reach way down. He'll reach way. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? What he did for Paul and Sardis, he did for me and you. Jesus will reach way down. Jesus will reach way down. He'll reach way down. He'll set your feet a dancing. He'll reach way down. Grab you up out of that bed. He'll set your feet a dancing on a mighty rock to stay. He'll reach way down. He'll reach way down. Reach down for your family. Jesus will pick you up. 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 Out of your fiery flame, he'll set your feet a dancing on a mighty rock to stay. Jesus will pick you up. Jesus will pick you up. What he did for Paul and Silas, he did for me and you. Jesus will pick you up. Jesus will pick you up. Out of your hospital room. Jesus will pick you up. Whatever you've done wrong. Oh, Jesus will pick you up. 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 But as you reach way. I don't know if you understand it, but Jesus will reach way. Jesus will pick you up. He will. How many feel like you've been down? If you feel like you've been down, then that's you're in the position. I said, if you feel like you're down, you're in the position for God to reach down to pick you up, to set your feet a dancing. Some of you going through some things, understand if you're down. It's time for God to reach down and do something in your life. Somebody just lift your hand up. So it, well, I'm fully convinced the more you lift your hands up to praise Him, the more you get out of what you've been in. The more you get out of what you've been in. The more you get out of what you've been in. Oh, somebody lift your hands and say, Pick me up, Lord. Pick me up, Lord. Pick me up, Lord. Pick me up, Lord. Me up, Lord. Oh, look to somebody and say, I'm coming up. I'm coming up. I'm coming up. Don't sound happy. This world to raise children. Hallelujah. Would you look at the children that are raised in church and you look at the ones that's raised in, in the hellish homes, the devilish homes. You, you look how they turn out. Even scientists are, and doctors are saying now that people that go to church live longer. I, uh, I'm so glad they preached the gospel. Hallelujah. And, and they said the reason why we live longer is because we trust in something that we call faith. But faith is more than something that we trust in. Faith is a lifestyle. Faith is something that I am from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, from the inside to out. Faith is what I am. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. I like for you to all stand to your feet. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Lord. Raise your hands. Father, these that brought their children to be dedicated, the Hannah was to Samuel, brought them back to the house of God to give them to God, for God to make missionaries, Holy Ghost preachers, evangelists, and to keep them healed, keep them out of prison, keep them out of jail, keep them out of trouble, keep them saved all the days of their life, and above all, Keep them on fire for God. Now they've come to give them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God. And on them. Praise the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Special dedication. In the name of Jesus. Dedicate them in the name of the Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, we challenge these parents this morning, according to the word of God, that they train these children in the ways of righteousness to live the life in front of them that would show them the way to God and to show them the right way. Father, we challenge the parents and the loved ones in the family this morning to keep these children in the house of God, to live the clean and the holy life in front of them. And Father, to raise them up to be God-fearing and to choose God as their leader in their life. And Father, we ask you to anoint these parents today and to try some hours that we're living in where there's trouble on every side. Father, the parents can make a difference by the lifestyle they live in front of them. And Father, we ask you to put a blessing on each one of these little ones. They never be hungry. They never be found in the street. They will never be shot. They will never die with an incurable disease, but they'll just change bodies to go to be with you. And Father, we ask you to put your protection upon them all these days. In your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Somebody give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Uh, which, uh, which, which, which in verse number 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Elikim, the son of, which, which Kilika, and I will clothe him with my, thy robe and strengthen him while thou girdle, and I will commit the, thy government into his hands, and he shall be a father in inhabitants of Jerusalem, and in the house of Judea, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. The key represents authority. The key uh, represents, and you, you, which in here was Shebala, which had been the, uh, the, the ruler, the, you know, the one in charge of the high court, which had not been faithful, and God said, I'm going to remove you out. I got somebody else I want to put in your place, and I'm going to give him the key. And this morning, I want to talk about just a little bit the key, our authority. Because the key of the house of David, at those days, they used to have a key that they would wear. A key that said they were someone. And the key, the larger the key, the, the, the more responsible person that they were. And I would give it, it's kind of like you go to a city today and they give you the, you know, the key to the city. And, and God, you begin to say, I'm going to take something off of the wall that you've had on the wall that you honored so much because of your unfaithfulness. And let me just read on the decks. And it says in verse 22, in the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder and so shall open and none shall shut and he shall, shall shut and none shall open. Means I'm going to give you authority to do whatever is, 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 is what's in your place and your ability. Verse 23, and I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. In his, their houses were not like our modern day houses where we had metal shelves, but they would put a nail upon the wall. And, and what's in anything that they would value, a trophy, they would hang on the, the nail on the wall. Everything that they wanted to show off, they would hang a nail on the wall. And this key was always hung upon the wall. But God had begun to say unto, uh, which unto a servant, he said, I'm going to give you the nail on the wall, and I'm going to give you the key to hang on the wall. Not only are you going to know that you're anointed and called of God, but those that come in and out of the house are going to know that you are anointed and called by God. I'm going to give you a sure place, and I'm going to give something that is for sure. And some of you sees other 
people, and, and which when you see how God has blessed other people, be sure to know that God is about to place a nail in the wall to hang the key that he has given you to hang it on. And some of you don't see that. Now all you see is somebody else has got the key and you want the key. But God said a transfer of anointing and a transfer of power is taking place. And God says whenever I begin to look at those that are unfaithful, I begin to look at those that are faithful. And those that are unfaithful, I will remove the key of the house of David and I will give it to those that are faithful. Whenever you have got a call on your life and God has spoken on you under and a mandate on your life to do something, if you do not do what God tells you to do, God will remove that key and the, and the nail that was hanging on the wall and God says, I will give it to another. Some of you look around and you say, but I am this and that. But you may not always be what you are today. You can be greater tomorrow or you can be worse tomorrow. But why? Because it is God that gives power. It is God that rises up and it is God that brings down. It is God that gives a promotion. And the Bible said in verse 24, and they shall, and thou shalt hang up on him all the glory of his father's house. What is going to be hung upon the nail? What is going to be hung upon the trophy? It's not going to be us, but it's going to be the glory of the father's house. When people begin to see us and see the nail, they're going to see the glory of the father's house. They're not going to see my, uh, my abilities or your abilities because our abilities are not going to be hung there. It's going to be for the glory of the father's house. We sometimes want recognition for ourselves, and that's why God takes the nail down. That's why God removes the key. But if you want to have the key and you want to use the key to loosen and to bind and to set free and to, and, and which, and to turn it loose, then you got to learn how to hang the nail and you got to learn how to hang the key on the nail and to say it's not my glory, it's not my anointing, but it is God's anointing. It is not I. I don't care how many dead people you raise. You're not a dead man raiser. I, I don't care how many people you laid hands on that their blind eyes are open. You're not a blind eye opener. I don't care how much money you got in the bank. You're not, not the man of prosperity. It is God and without his anointing and without his glory we are nothing. So therefore we must realize that when God has given us a key and he's given us authority what are we doing with that key and that authority? The Bible said whatsoever we bind on earth he will bind it in heaven. Why? Because the glory is connected unto him. It is not about us. It's about him. It's whatever we loosen on earth he will loosen in heaven. Why? It's a two way key. When we put it in faith it opens up the carnal and opens up the spiritual and this is where our faith is. Our faith is we walk into a dark situation and we know it's dark but we understand the key will let us into the light and this is our faith that we have in our word of God. Now see this was a prophetic word that was given. A prophetic word was given at a time that a man thought he had everything right. A man was doing everything that he wanted to do but when God got into the situation God began to say I'll take you off of that nail and I'll remove it and it even goes on a little bit further and says I can even remove this nail so it don't make any difference what you are today who you are today the God that I serve has the power to bring you up and has the power to bring you down you may be exhausted today and you may be abased tomorrow it is God that gives you power it is God that gives you the word it is God that gives you the strength you are nobody you're only the branches he's the vine and without him we are nothing we cannot produce nothing within ourselves. it takes the power of God in our life to do it now it was at a time where that that God was moving in with his people because he wanted to show them that he was God and the Bible said in verse number 22 in the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulders God said I'm going to lay something up on his shoulders so that he can open and no man can shut and you can shut and no man opens I believe there's things and anointings that powers that God gives us in our life that in which uh, in the book of Isaiah chapter 22 that says that he will lay the key upon us we have to understand it's not our key the key is just laid upon us it is not our anointing the anointing comes from him and the Bible says that you, you when Shibala was a steward and official, and but she, you know, but, but he was not doing everything that he was supposed to do. 
uh, but now God began to replace him and God began to take you know it's God that brings promotion and promotion comes from above it's God that brings in and it's God that takes out what we don't understand something is is those people who walk in, in spirit are always walking ahead of flesh because those people walking in flesh can never be walking in the spirit but, uh, but people walking in the spirits always one step ahead of flesh because flesh says, I am mandated from where I am now, from where, because where I've been. What we've been through in the past mandates where we are now and begins to dictate where we go in the future. Our, our failures in the past begin to say we can never go any further than where we are now. But now is a flesh thing, but faith is a tomorrow thing. Faith is something in the future. Faith is I can't see, but my faith is walking out ahead of my flesh. My flesh says there is no way that you're going to turn this thing around. But faith says go ahead and believe me and I will turn it around uh, flesh says there is impossible to receive what you need in the time that you need it in but faith says go ahead and trust me and watch me give you what I that you have need of uh, watch me change situations because God said I am he that gives you power to receive wealth uh, it is God that gives it to you it is God that multiplies it is God that gives you your breath uh, has not the father has not the reign of father does not it rain only because when God says it's to rain. God will make it rain on one and not make it rain on another. He will bless one and he'll curse another. The God that we serve is a God that's able to do it. But you got to walk in faith and not walk in flesh. Because flesh begins to eat away at you. Flesh, uh, flesh says you have to walk in your problems. But spirit of faith says I walk ahead of my problems. You know, you, whenever you walk in when you, when you walk in faith, you walk in a revelation. When you walk in flesh, you walk in, in what you see. But I want to walk in a revelation. A revelation is something that I cannot see uh, in the carnal, but it's only something I can see in the spiritual. A revelation is something that if I try real hard, I may even be able to put it on pencil, and I may be able to write it down, but there's going to be something that I left out. There are going to be some stepping stones that when God began to show it to me, he began to show it to me at such of a quick pace that when God begins to give us a revelation, what part of that revelation do we remember the most? Not the beginning, not the middle, but the end. We forget all of the revelation that God shows us. God begins to show us a revelation. He'll show you riding around in a car. You forget the revelation that he showed you to get the car. All you see is the car. You know, when God begins to show you revelation, how that your ministry is going to multiply and you're going to be, you see yourself here, but you forget to look at the steps that it took for you to get there because our revelation is what we see at the end. And that is the Z part. But from A to Z, there's some stepping stones that you got to go through. And there's some, uh, so there's some troubles that you're going to go through, some trials that you're going to go through, some persecutions that you're going to go through. But you know what keeps us going through? We keep our eyes on the end. Because the eyes on the end it starts looking at it's bigger than the problem. Why? Because that's the revelation that we have. This is what keeps people going in the middle of a storm. Is they got a revelation of what God's going to do for them. This is what keeps people going. Is when in the middle of the storm you get a phone call that the devil said your baby's this and your son's this and your son's this. But you praise God anyhow because you have a revelation of what God told you. It's not what it is at the beginning. It's not what it it is in the middle, but of what is going to be in it at the end. Now, see, when we begin to understand something about the revelation knowledge of God, that God begins to order some things. And when God begins to order some things, it's always, I don't know with you, but my greatest miracles always come in the middle of the dark. You know, I like to look like it like this. The vision is brighter in the dark than it is in the light. How do you, uh, let me explain it to you another way. If you're on an airplane and it's in the middle of the daytime and they want to show a movie, they tell everybody, shut all the windows so that it gets dark outside so you can see the revelation on the screen. 
Sometimes we need to have to shut off secondary light to be able to see the vision and the revelation that God wants to give us. What is secondary light? Secondary light is when we try to be enlightened by an unsaved person on our job. Secondary light is whenever we begin to trust totally in the doctor and totally in the lawyer and totally in the judge. Secondary light is when you begin to look at your own ability and say, I cannot do it, but we need to get to the place that we shut off the secondary light like and the secondary light so that now we can see clearly the vision that God has set before us. When you say brother Steve but when did the the vision appear? When was it on the screen? It had always been on the screen but because of the secondary light you could not see the vision and you could not make it clear. You knew what it was. You knew uh, seeing through a glass darkly. You could almost see what it was. You could almost make it what it was but there was too much outside interference uh, coming in. That's why we got sometimes to get along and let God turn your lights out. Uh, let God turn it. That's how God shows up in the middle of a trial and he comes up in a time when you don't have any money and starts telling you how blessed you're going to be uh, when you're the sickest uh, and he tells you how healed you're going to be uh, when you're the outcast uh, and he tells you the leader you're going to be. Uh, that's the time that God shows up is when it gets dark. When it gets dark outside, get ready for a light to be turned on. Because there is something that God wants to do for us. Hallelujah. Because God wants to turn on a vision so you can see it. You know, it's one thing to have had something and lost it. And say, I'm sure glad to get this back. And it's another thing to have something that you've never had before. Hallelujah. And God said, I want to take you to a place that you can say, I've never been here before. I want to take you to a height that you said, I've never even understood how I could get this high up. I want to take you to a place that you cannot say, oh, this is as good as it was last time. But I want to take you to a place that it says it's better than it's ever been before. I want to bring you in to a revelation knowledge that you don't worry about what you're going through today. You'll just dance right on through where everybody else is moaning and groaning and crying. But you're saying, I'm going to a place this is you say is it scriptural yeah it's scriptural the Bible said eyes is not seen ears is not heard neither has it entered into the heart of man God said you only think you know what heaven's about you really don't know what heaven's about you have nothing to describe it to you have nothing to compare it to I'm taking you to a higher and a better place now who does he want to give this to he wants to give it to those you know, that won't walk by their substance. To say my substance is mandating where I'm going. I'm walking out of my past and I'm walking into my presence. Because you can't live in your past because your past will never get you there. This is why that God shows up in the middle of the dark of the night. Whenever it seems like there's no other way that you do it, you pull down all the shades. Daniel... Before he really could say that God would take you out of the lion's den, he had to go in the lion's den. Now, was he worried when he went in? He said, sleep on, King. Live on, King. Don't worry about me, King. Everything's okay with me, King. Now, the King, and everything wasn't okay with the King. Why? He stayed up all night long. There's some of you staying up all night long. Why? You forgot to look at the end of the revelation that God promised you. And you get so discouraged, you get over there. Hallelujah. The prophet even done this. He got under a, a, a tree and said, I'm not as good as my father's. I wish that I could just lay here and die. Now, here's a man just called fire out of heaven. Here was a man here just consumed sacrifices. Here was a man here that just met God face to face. And only because he had one Jezebel, one devil come out against him. One problem in his life, one situation, he going to run. Now, where is the God that just brought fire out of heaven? Where is his faith at? He lays down under a tree, and an angel begins to nudge him and say, Hey, boy, there's a destiny in your life. There is something that you got to get up. 
I, I, I've come out here in the wilderness. I understand you're trying to run. When you, when you, when you know what the revelation is, you know what the vision is, get up from where you are. Oh, but I don't have nothing to eat. That ain't a problem. Get up and eat. For great is your journey because I have a destiny for you. I have a promise for you. I have something I want to get for you. I want to give unto you. But, 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 but he said, get up. And he got up and eat a little bit, kind of like you do when you come to church. You eat a little bit, but you don't eat enough to make it through Wednesday night. You don't eat enough to get you there till Sunday night. You don't eat enough to get you there to Friday morning. You're always, always hungry again. Why? There is a revelation knowledge that you need to get from God that who God is and how big God is. If we could see how big God is, we wouldn't worry about the little problems that we have, but we would dance on our problems and dance through the fire and dance through the trial because the God that we serve is bigger than this. I said, get up and eat. You got a 40-day, a 40-day journey ahead of you. 40 days, you ain't going to eat nothing, boy. But he had a destiny. Whenever it gets to the place that God will begin to work for you in a way that he had never worked for you before. Turn with me and since we're in the book of Isaiah over to chapter 38. Hallelujah. And the Bible talks about in Isaiah chapter 38, in those days was Hezekiah. Who was Hezekiah? The king, 55 years old, the king, 55 years old, just got to be a senior citizen, but he was sick. And Isaiah, the prophet, came to him. Now, see, God didn't send a beginning prophet. He sent the prophet. He began to send him a word. And the word was that something's about to change in your life. A word was, and let me stop this here long enough to, to throw something out. Just because you get a word, don't mean you have to die with that word. If somebody comes and gives you a word, and if that word is contrary to what God's already give you, did you hear it? Huh? Huh? Oh, you know, it's like kids today. They have selective hearing. They hear what they want to hear. What you can say, Johnny, get up and come and clean your room. Johnny ain't heard nothing. You can say real easy, Johnny, Billy's at the door. Boom, 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 boom. Here comes Johnny out of the bedroom. Selective hearing. The church needs to get selective hearing. When somebody comes and gives you a word and God ain't told it to you, <laughs> recycle bin. Recycle bin. Throw it in. Throw it in and then hit that that, that empty button up there in the corner that says empty the recycle bin. Why? Because God will tell you first before he tells somebody else. God is not bringing surprises in on you. You already know what God begins to say unto you. So now here we begin to say, Isaiah begin to say, Bob, you're going to die and not live. Set your house in order. Get all your paperwork done. Get everything that you have need to be done. Get ready. Go buy your funeral arrangement. Get ready to pick out your songs to sing. Get ready. In those days, they hired the mourners. Hire all the mourners that you want to hire. It. Have a practice run through. Make sure everything's going to be the way you want it. No, that's not what Hezekiah done. Hezekiah didn't let Isaiah's footprints get cold. The sand was still moving under his feet that he began to run himself to the wall and say, uh-uh, I have a vision. I have a promise. I have a word from God, and I'm not stopping in the middle of my vision to let anybody stop me. Now, was the word from God from I, you know, to Isaiah? Yes, it was. But also, Hezekiah had another word. Was it that God forgot the other word? No, I believe that God was just testing Hezekiah to see if he remembered the other word, to see if he remembered what he used to say. And he began to set, set his face to the wall. And he began to cry out. And he began to call unto the Lord. And the first thing that he'd done that a lot of the church people today cannot do. Check 
the book. No, no, no. We want God to hide the book. We hope that God loses some pages out of the book. We hope that God don't turn to certain pages in the book because there's certain pages that we tried to hide under the kernel and under the flesh. But he said, check the book and see if I've not lived a holy life. See if I've not done what you told me to do. Check my life. See if I've not prayed how I'm supposed to pray. See if I've not given my tithe. See if I've not witnessed. See if I've not testified. Did I not live the life? Did I not work the way you told me to work? Did I not give it my all in all? Check the book. And as he began to say, okay, let me check the book. He began to go back and read with me in verse number three. And, read, and said, oh, remember now, I want you to say now. Because what I want from God, I want him to remember it now. Because now is the time that I need my miracle. Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I walk before thee in truth with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sorely or greatly. And the word of the Lord came unto Isaiah and said, Go back to Isaiah, in which Hezekiah, and say, The Lord God of thy father, David, thy father. Hallelujah, if you want to underline David, that father, because this is part of what he was praying. This is why God come back to Hezekiah, begin to mention unto Hezekiah, and he said, Father, the God of thy father, thy David, I heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, and I will add unto thee 15 more years. Why did he get 15 more years? How old did I say you know, that, uh, that Hezekiah was? He was 55 years old. Back in Psalms chapter 90, about verse number 10, he said that you could live to be 70, and by some good uh, uh, reason that you uh, or strength that you may live to be 80. Now Hezekiah was 55, and he was saying, Okay, God, okay, you give a promise unto David. He was one of my fathers that if we will live a good and holy life, that we can live to be 70 years old. I want my 70 years, and I'm not checking out of here at 55 when you said I could live to be 70. What is that? He began to see the vision at the end. He began to look at the end vision. He did not look at the now vision. The now vision said, hey, I know I'm sick. The now vision said, hey, I know there's something wrong. The now vision said, even the man of God come by and said how bad I was. But the truth was my eye is at the end revelation of the knowledge that God said I could live to be 70 years old so I want my other 15 years not only was this he did not have a son to carry his name on and his son had not been born and hallelujah and I believe that God wanted him to have a son now his son Manassas turned out to be evil and bad but and it started being king when he was 12 years old so somewhere two years later his wife got pregnant God let him stay around long enough to train him up unto the year of 12 years old unto the year of accountability and begin to say okay boy you're accountable for the kingdom now now my last is he went to, and he done wrong and done evil in his uh, in the sight of God and did not follow in his footsteps of his father but uh, the, but the Bible said that Hezekiah he got 15 more years why did he get those 15 years because he turned his face to the wall he turned out the secondary light. He quit letting other people show him his vision. And some of you need to turn your face to the wall. Quit looking at your problem. Quit looking at your trial. And start hearing what God said he was going to do. Stand up and believe that he is God. And that he is able to do what he said he was doing. Turn out the secondary vision. And turn your face to the wall. Now, now God was going to do something great. He said, okay, God, you're going to do all this. I want a sign. And this is the title of my sermon today. God's Daylight Savings Time. First time in the Word where God turned back the time. Somebody wondering if it was scriptural. It is scriptural. He said, what you want to do? He said, I want you. You wanted to go down 10 degrees? No, I see that happen every day. <laughs> But never in my life, God, have I ever seen it to go back the other way. And I believe that you're a kind of God that controls the sun. 
I believe you're the God that controls every situation. I believe that you cause the sun to rise in the morning and the sun to set at night time. And, and, which is, and God, you're so good of a God, you're always on time. It always stays the same. You, you have a perfect time. And sometimes you don't think God's on. God's always on time. God knows what he's doing in the midst of everything that you're going through in your life. He knows what he's doing. God understands about the trials and the situations and he says what you want to do he said I wanted to go back I wanted to go back 10 degrees now see when you, we, 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 which as we begin to hear about a sundial we used to always think about a sundial as the kind that you know, the little metal thing on a big round thing that goes back that's not the kind of sundial it was because what God was about to do he was going to do it so the king could sit in his palace and watch what God was doing in his presence now see the king did not altogether agree, agree with what was going on but the Bible says that whenever the you know, history says uh, the, you know, the, the times of, of those times it was like steps and whenever would y'all ever watch the shadow of a building whenever the shadow would climb the steps or go up the steps and the shadow well the steps were actually the clock for the whole city to see a building was built next to it and as the sun began to rise up it would close this step so if you was across town you could look to see what step it was on to know what time it was and God said I'm going to let some steps climb up backwards where you've never seen him come up backwards before so that not only he can see it but everybody else in the town could see it and he began to talk about he wanted the sun tower to turn back you say can God I'm telling you God is so concerned about the battle you're in he'll stop the sun if he has to stop the sun he'll stop the moon if he has to stop the moon for you to get your destiny he'll do what he has to do he'll turn the water into wine turn the river into blood he will do what he has to do for you to get your destiny but you got to trust and believe that he's the kind of God that will I'm not standing here preaching this morning that we have a, a God that is not a big God but I'm telling you we have an awesome God we have have a God that's got it all in control. And when we begin to understand something, all the way back over in the book of Joshua, turn with me to the book of Joshua, chapter number 10. The Bible said the kings, the five kings of the Armalites said, come out against the Gibeons. Verse number 6 in chapter 10. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua at the camp of Gil with, with Gilgal and said, Slack not thy hands from thy servants. Come and help us for the kings of Armalites that dwell in the mountains are coming out, out together against us. And jo verse number 7, And Jehoshua ascended from with Gilgad, and, and he and the people of the war with him, and all the men of the valor, all of them got together. Hear what took place. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Tell them, Fear not, for I have to deliver them into thy hands. And they shall no man stand before thee. The darkest time before the revelation of a vision is when it gets real dark. When it gets real dark, get ready for the light to come on. And the Bible said, verse number 9, that Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up to Gilgai all night. And the Lord discomforted them all the day long and night until all of a sudden the sun started going down. Let me tell you how much God wants you to get your destiny. He will not only turn the sun back one hour, 10 degrees. He will stop the sun as long as it takes for you to get your miracle. Whatever it takes for you to get through, God's going to do it so you can have victory to give him the honor and the glory because the nail that he hung up in the house is a sure nail and he wants to get glory and honor and whatever he has to do, he will do it at the darkest time. And it looked like the sun was going down. Oh, Joshua and his men, they were out there. They were just uh, they was knocking heads left and right. They were winning on every side. Then all of a sudden, the sun started going down. And I could just 
just hear something starting to talk to jo with Joshua and said, when the sun goes down, they're in the mountain. They pulled you in the mountain and now you're going to be in trouble because these men, these Armalite men, they know how to fight in the mountains. You know how to fight in the valley. They now got you up in the mountain. They're going to kill. But all of a sudden, when the sun started crossing the top of the hills and the sun began to get dark, he looked up and said, son, I'm not finished with this battle just yet. You just stand still. Moon, you stand still. Why? Because I got a fight going on and I'm going to win this battle. And some of you need to understand something about God. I don't care where you are now. Don't let your now be mandated by your yesterday and dictate your tomorrow because your yesterday is gone and your now is the first day of you walking out of one door into another door. Yes, it's dark outside, but the light is on on the inside. All you have to do is walk through. You're just one step. You're just one breath away from being into the blessings of God. You're just one move. You're just one praise. You're just one dance. You're just one hallelujah. You're just one move from getting in to where God wants you to be. All you say, but they're messing with the sun and they're turning the sun back. Don't get so upset when scientists and the, and the people in America turns the clock back and turns it forward. God's been doing it for a long time because you know what he done. He said, I'm going to turn back the shadow. You know what the shadow is? Some of you have had the, the shadow coming after you. And David said, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, but I didn't fear no evil. You know why? I knew it was only a shadow, and a shadow couldn't do me no harm. And I understood the devil could not kill me. It was only the devil standing over me, waiting for me to, hallelujah, time that he could get in. But it was only a shadow because his rod and his staff, they comforted me. The devil may be coming after you, but God will move the shadow back, saying, get back, you're getting too close. Get back, you can't have that child. Get back, you can't have that family. Get back, you can't have that husband. Get back, you can't have that body. Get back, you can't have that ministry. Don't let the devil scare you with a shadow. And the Bible said that the shadow turned back. What was that shadow turned back? It was death. Death running after him. Death trying to get him. Every time he looked over his shoulder, death was there. You know the day that you was born was the day you started dying. Shadow began to get on your case. You always will have a shadow. What creates a shadow? What creates a shadow? I want to talk about what creates a shadow. You know, because the thing that creates a shadow is a thing that we must reverence and understand. It takes, always takes a light to create a shadow. And when we begin to stand in the, in the luminous glory of God, He begins to throw His light upon us if there's a shadow behind us. When we're looking at him, the shadow is behind us. And anywhere you'll find the devil, you all, which in a saint of God's life, and in a, which in a person that walks in faith's life, you'll always find the devil in the shadow. Why? The devil's always behind pursuing, trying to catch up. But the Bible said we're ahead of the devil and that we are in front of the devil and he's only in our shadow. That's why the devil only works in your past. That's why he torments you. Your mama done this and your daddy done this and you remember this and you remember that. Always in the past. He won't no one mess up your future because he can't control. He knows that you don't know much about your future, but it's your past. He, and that's why he wants you to live in your past. That's where he's living. He's living in the shadow of where you've been. But what the devil's got to understand, he will always be in my past. Why? I have him under my feet. He will always be behind me. He will always be in pursuit of me. Why? Because I am in the pursuit of the nail hanging on the cross. Because that nail really represents more than just a nail hanging up there to hang the key of the city. Because uh, over 4,000 years later a man by the name of Jesus Christ, he was nailed to a sure cross and he was nailed there for the glory of the father of the begotten and he was nailed there for me and for you and that nail held him there until God said for him to come down and the Bible says that the shadow overshadowed him now in the book of Acts and I know I'm just saying my sermon but I'm going there anyhow in the book of Acts Peter walking down the street in a shadow overshadowed them now you have to stop and think why did he have a shadow 
he had a glory light shining on him. And the only way that these people could be healed is what Peter had been through. Where he had come from. His reputation of him walking with Jesus. His reputation of the glory of God all around about him. His reputation of, of, of upper room experience. Now the light began to shine on him. He didn't even have to touch them. The glory of God that was in his life was enough to overshadow them and heal them. There'll be people in your life and people in your house. They will not sit down and let you lay hands on them. But what you're going through now is going to be the gateway of them coming out of what they're in now. What they see God do for you now is going to be the doorway for them to get through what they're getting through. Oh yes, God may have had to turn the clock back. And yes, God may have had to hold the sun still. But let me tell you, God is in control of our destiny. If we will heed and do what God has for us to do, let's don't get so religious and caught up in the carnal and caught up in all the flesh uh, that God comes and he removes the key from us uh, and he gives it to somebody else. Uh, what does that tell me? God said, I'm going to have a door open and if you don't open it, I will find me another one that will open the door. Uh, I will find me another one that I can use. Uh, I will find me another one uh, that I can hang on the wall as a trophy. God said, I'm going to use what I have to use. But why is it that God works in the darkness so because the devil claims the darkness for himself but God says I'll get into your yard would you say what about all the darkness in the night in the book of Genesis God says out of darkness light will come where, where, where are we some of you are in the darkest time of your life light's going to come out of darkness and the Bible said the light and the, I mean the darkness comprehended it not. Meaning it could not overrun it and run it down and overtake it. When you get ready to turn on and you get ready for the glory of God to shine he's going to bring you out of the darkness the spotlight of God's going to be upon you you're going to leave a shadow where you've been what you've been through it's going to be history it's going to be past now you can stay back there in dark if you want to you know a comfortable place to be is in the dark because you don't see your problems you, uh, which, you, uh, which you don't see your situations uh, but it's time you come out of the dark it's time that you the Bible said that God created darkness uh, which, and he created the night in the book of Genesis but he said I ain't gonna leave the night on the earth and where my children's going there ain't gonna be no more nights so he said in the book of Revelation I will do away with the night why because where the revelation that they're going there's gonna be no more night so when we get out of this body and we get on the other side you ain't gonna have to worry about going through another storm another night another sickness another trial so you can stay in your darkness if you want to now if you don't get ready and go to heaven with us the Bible says hell it may have fire but it's dark it's a, it's a heat that you feel but not a light that produces because there's no light in hell the Bible said they'll be weeping and screaming and clawing for eternity for on and on and on so if you want to go to hell you go ahead and go to hell if you don't want to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior and say yes to Jesus I will do what's right give me the key of David let me unlock what you want me to unlock let me be what you want me to be or you just go ahead and go to hell if you want to. Nobody can stop you. If you got a made up mind, you're going there. There's some people got a made up mind. They're going to hell. There's some people, yeah, they're going to hell. I could preach this sermon this morning. There's people sitting here in this service. Says, I will not give my heart to Jesus. I will sit down. I come to church and they really don't even know the real me. Jesus knows the real you. They really don't know me. Oh, the pastor thinks I pay my dues every Sunday and I drop in a love offering here and there. Keep your money. Your money will not get you into heaven. It's a relationship between you and Jesus Christ. 
It's a relationship that you must say, I'm coming out of darkness and I'm coming into a marvelous light. It's a revelation that I see Jesus dying on the cross and I want, to, I want him to be my personal savior. It's got to be a revelation. Are there going to be any bumps in the road? Yes, there's going to be bumps in the road. Are there going to be humps? Yes, there's going to be humps. Are there going to be trials? Yes, there's going to be trials. But that's the trying of your faith to see if you really saw the revelation, to really see if you have the knowledge do you really have what it takes? Do you really have, you know, by because if you're going up there where there is going to be no more night, there's no going to be no more weeping and no more crying. You got to have a made up mind. You got to have a heart to say, I am ready to serve Jesus. You say, but Pastor Steve, none of my friends and my husband, how you can go to hell with them if you want to. I'm going to go to heaven if I have to go by myself. I'm going to go if I have to walk this road by myself. You say, but it's so dark. Oh, you know what keeps me going? I see a light at the end of the tunnel. You know what keeps me going? It's because I have a destiny. I have a word. I have a vision. And that vision says if I keep on going, that God will meet me at the end of the journey. If I keep on going, that I will make heaven my home. If I keep on going, I will have victory. If I keep on going, I will bring someone else behind me. You don't go to hell by yourself. And you don't go to heaven by yourself. There's a shadow behind you. Daddy, little boys are walking in your shadow. Mamas, little girls are walking in your shadow. Grannies, little granddaughters are walking in your shadows. Some grannies are more of a mama than a mama is to a mama. Howdy, granny. Papa, they're looking at you. When you see my children and my grandchildren... My grandchildren get sick. They want to call Papa. Why? Want to call Ganky. Why? They know that we know how to pray. And that God will turn something around in their life. What shadow are you under? There's two types of shadow that you be under. There's the shadow of life. And there's a shadow of death. I don't know what shadow you under. But I'm under the shadow of life. And those that will come and follow after me will find life and find peace and find joy. Hallelujah. If you want to turn and go that other way, this is why David was not afraid to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Somebody was in death with him. Somebody was in darkness with him. You know what makes the difference? Is when you get to that crossing of the chilly tide. Oh, I've been there when my mama left and my grandma left and my grandpa left. And I've been there when saints of God has left. And oh, yes, there have been a few that I've been able to jerk back from the other side and bring back. Oh, but there's been a bunch of them that God said it's their time to go. And when that time comes, are you ready? Oh, but you say, but I'm not old. I'm young. Have you been to the cemetery lately? 18 years old. Mother of three. Taken out in the prime of her life. She was only 17.